precious are the ones that know your name. Even if the stars begin to wane, precious are the ones that soothe the sting. The whisper on the wind when they call. I think we're live. Are we live? <laughs> Greetings, my friends. Welcome to the 50th year of Mr. Fenner performing. Well, all these years. I mean, it doesn't seem like 50 years. It feels like 50 minutes, but hey ho. Sorry about last um, last Saturday. Uh, my little helper, Lynn. <laughs> Got to blame someone. No, it was my fault. I kicked the bloody. Uh, I kicked the camera out which was a bit of a stupid thing. And all I could hear was when I, you know, you'd all disappeared, was me cursing, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but there you go. I am a clockwork man living in a digital age, so forgive me. Um, before we go any further, I wanna thank, uh, I've had about 1,500 new subscribers since the last live stream, which was um, last month. Uh, I put up 12 new uploads. I'm reading this from a piece of paper, because I'll forget. Um, 12 new uploads have gone up there. Um, I'd like you to, while you're on, to, I've had loads of people contacting me asking about everything from capos to bar, you know, bar chords to strumming to chord changes. So this is your opportunity now while I'm here, you know, to ask me whatever you like. And if I can, I, if I can uh, help you out, then I will. While you're on. Um, there we go. Right, I, I've just been told as well. The super chats. If you want to get a question to the top of the list, then there's a super chat button. And if you make a little donation, then apparently I, I'm, I'm, you don't have to do that, of course. But if you do your question, boink, it goes straight to the top of the pile. So, and of course, I will answer those first because they will stand out like a sore thumb. Okay, so the super chat button. If you want a question, highlighting. If you do that, then it, of course it'll, it'll bounce up. It's at the, on the bottom right, apparently. Like I said, I am a digital, uh, sorry, I'm a clockwork man in the digital age. I don't even know, I didn't even know until last week what it was or the, a couple of weeks ago. So thank you for that. Uh, what else have we got to do? Right, picking, strumming, chord changes, we've discussed that. Um, 
I did the last of the master. I've done. I've done eight master classes in uh, over the last eight weeks, and I did them because, as you all know, I've got about three hundred videos up. I put. I started doing this during the pandemic because I was bored shitless and had nothing to do, um, and I got. It, I got to really enjoy doing it, and people were liking it, and uh, you know, I got m more and more viewers. So, but one of the things that people used to say to me is, "Look, you know, you're putting some stuff up there, but we've never played before. We don't know." how to join in because we've never done anything um, so I put together eight master classes um, obviously one to eight uh, and I'm hoping that you've all been through them the first one was um, was just the basic stuff you know basic chords how to change all that sort of stuff but I did the the last one on um, on Wednesday uh, and it was to do with um, uh, you know the cage system now the cage system again is one of those weird things it's, it's something that I wished I'd learnt years ago and it's all about where you'd put your capo you know so if you've not and, and it's really important especially if you're into studio um playing and all that sort of stuff then you know it's something that you really need to know right so the first thing i want you to do is uh have a think about any questions you might have i'm having a look here oh yeah 50 years in the business yeah and i don't look a day over 100 thanks for that that was uh of andy andy riley thank you for that one was open for the morrissey song um <laughs> Johnny Marr that isn't it um, there we are what else have we got let's have a look I'm gonna spend some time looking at these today uh, Dave Gray Northern Ireland nice to meet you there Dave uh, where are we Stephen Lyons hi Rob been following watching you but having a clue how to, <laughs> how to progress a bit there's Steve there Stevie War thank you Steve um, and Anthony uh, what else have we got any tips for an electric guitar player to play acoustic with arthritic fingers um, yeah work on open tuning you know people like Joni Mitchell now people don't know this but open tuning it's not some sort of flash thing that you do because you're dead good you tend to use open tuning when you're not that good because you might have arthritis or you might have something wrong with your fingers now Joni Mitchell is a, is a perfect example she had uh, polio as a kid so she couldn't use her hands very well her fingers and all that sort of stuff so she used an open tuning which in effect means you tune your guitar up to a chord so instead of um, instead of having to press your fingers down to play one, you just hit the strings and it's already done for you. Uh, and I think we can all agree that it didn't stop her from writing some of the most beautiful songs um, in the last 20, 30, 40 years or whatever it was. So um, open tuning, Keith Richards uses it all the time, you know, on, on all that stone stuff. Because he, you know, if you look at his fingers, he, I mean, I'm surprised he's still breathing. I think they dig him up every time they go on tour, you know. But um, open tune, that's good. Mike Witt, my good chum, Mike Witt. Uh, hi, Mike, how are you doing? Um, what are sus chords suspended? Now, you've got to remember, I'm not very good at theory, right? I know enough. I, I like it. I, I mean, I know it's an ignorant thing, probably, to say. But I know it, I'm a bit like the guy that um, I know how to, I learned how to drive. But I don't need to know the workings of the combustion engine to get me to the shops to buy a pint of milk. And it's, I feel like that about guitar playing. I know enough theory, what keys it in, I know what to do. And I use the guitar to write with, you see. I didn't get into guitar playing because I just wanted to copy other people's stuff. For those people that know me, they know that I'm interested and always have been in composing and writing for, whether it's um, making our own albums with various bands that I've been in, um, to a lot of TV stuff I've done. I've done one film, but it was the title to that, for title music to the film. And that was a jazz piece. I'm not very good at jazz, so I was quite surprised when uh, I got the job to do that one. And uh, it turned out very well. It's called Al's Lads. It's an Al Capone film. So if you you might be able to dig it up on Netflix or one of those. But um, it was a thing called The Mauritania Rag. So even though I'm not up on jazz, I managed to get a film out of it. Um, but all other styles I'm pretty good at. Um, and I think the another... Uh, question I get asked a lot is what genre of playing do I prefer and the honest answer is and I think this is, this is what's kept me going for 50 years without being out of work is I like every different style most styles of playing you know because I like writing most styles of playing so if I like if I want to write a country song then I will learn how to play you know in that in that in that way if I want to write a classical piece of music then I'll learn how to play classical guitar and that's how I do it you know and, and honestly that is the real reason because in my head I don't think of myself as a guitar player 
I think of myself as somebody that writes music, you know, that's the thing. Um, now, do you need to know a lot of theory in order to do that? Well, the answer to that is no, you need to know a bit, you know. For example, um, I wrote, along with my brother Al, we wrote a, a musical st adaptation of a, of a famous book called Tuppence Cross the Mersey by an author called Helen Forrester, and it was a big success toward the UK. You know, it sold out the Empire, you know, loads and loads of times, which is a, over 2,000 seats of theatre up here in Liverpool. And uh, we were invited to play all the music from that particular show with the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra, very well respected orchestra here in the UK. And the Philharmonic Hall is an iconic, you know, place to, to, to play. But the irony of it is, we're, we're on the stage, you know, and, uh, you know, it's all about playing all my own stuff. The orchestra are there, I'm there in my leather coat and my silly hat, you know, and all that stuff. And um, the irony of it is that all the music that was being played was was mine and, and, and my brother Al's, and yet we were the only ones on that stage that couldn't read a bloody note. Everybody else in the orchestra, of course, could, but we couldn't read a note. If somebody had presented our own music to us, we wouldn't have had a clue what it was that we were looking at. In fact, we didn't, you know, it, just, it was just like fly shit as we ignorant musicians put it but that's not to say that theory isn't important I know a lot of jazz musicians uh, you know um, like the theory side of it you know that's what they tend to do um, but really I think there's probably only two jobs that you need if you want to be a professional guitar player I mean a professional guitarist I'm not talking about singer songwriter I'm talking about a professional guitarist if you want to be a guitar player alone then um, I think reading is important, but there are only two main jobs that you'll get from being able to read, being a professional guitarist. One is if you want to play in a, a theatre band, where you know you're sitting in the in the uh, in, in the orchestra pit in the dark for most of your life, and there's a new show coming in every week. In which case, you're going to need to be well up, well versed on uh, you know the, playing all the different types of music from all those shows. So they'll just throw music at you, and you'll need to know what to play so reading music if you want to do that job is essential um, the other time is if you work if you want to be uh, in a band on a cruise ship and every time they, honestly you know I'm not kidding I know I know my mates who do it uh, and every time the, the, the cruise ship the docks you know another artist will get on and, and they'll present you with the dots and you know you'll be playing ABBA or whatever it is that people like to dance to on a, a rocking boat in the middle of the Caribbean it's not for me that the idea of doing that is horrible you know so um i'm into writing and all my mates i don't know one guitar player in my 50 years of professional playing not i don't know one that reads music not one in fact i've written a classical piece of music called samana which i think there's a rough version of it on my site but uh i have be desperately been trying to find um a, a, a classical player that can uh transpose it for me from my tablature because I've just written it out in tab and I've performed it but um, I'd like to be able to present it to a, another classical guitar player and say could you play that for me please and I'd like to see how they interpret it so if any of you out there you know and there are a couple of people that read music because I get some little remarks every now and again about how important theory is and all that sort of stuff so if any of you are out there watching this please get in touch with me and if you think you can compose this piece of music that I've done, then get in touch because um, I'll pay you. I won't expect you to do it for now. But um, I want it doing because I want to be able to present it in a, you know, a proper musical format, okay? So there's that, right, let's carry on. So we've done Masterclass 3, which was the riffology thing. What was that about? It was all about, do you see? It's all about how uh, you know guitar riffs that, that mother, mother of all riffs as I call it is responsible for tons and tons of hit songs you know like um, that type of thing we did that one we did a simplified version of every breath you take by the police I don't know which way this camera is here we are let me just spin around so you can see me a bit more okay so oh my tea's just arrived Asking. Yeah, would you like to? Uh, this is the lovely Lynn, my the lovely Lynn. But this is Hello. the lady you saw scurrying around at the end of the session last time. Yes, I don't know if you blame me. Well, you've got to blame something. The first rule of being a professional musician in my 50 years 
especially if you're in a band. If you're the singer, you blame the lead guitar player. The lead guitar player will blame the rhythm guitar player, who will in turn blame the bass player, and then we'll all turn around and blame the drummer. Well, that's and funny, because you blame me for everything else. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, yeah, but, uh, you know. I'm going to leave you to it. All right, all right, thank you. Let thank me know when you're on the hook. Oh, yeah, I've got the right mug as well. Yeah, yeah. This is important. People that know will know this is really, really important. Okay? The prisoner. We did a, we, in fact, funnily enough, I did, uh, again with Brother Al, we bought a sampling machine in the 90s, the early 90s, and uh, I did a deal with a company called ITC that all, uh, own all those old um, TV series, including The Prisoner. And they, uh, the, we wanted to, and we did, we didn't want to, we did it. We sampled all McGowan's voice, uh, Patrick McGowan's voices, and uh, off from this TV series, and put some music to it. And uh, it came out as a single, it did very well in Britain but um, it was called Fallout. And it's quite rare now, because I know five years after it came out, it was in a, a magazine called Record Collector, and it had gone up, it was about, I think it was about eight or nine quid. A quid, by the way, for you people in the States is, is what we call a pound over here, okay? So it was, it was eight or nine pound then. So uh, it was called Fallout, but um, The Prisoner is a, t if you've not watched it, it's a television series you really, really need to get into. So anyway, every breath you take, we did. We looked at the riffs and chords combined. What did that mean? Well, that was going. You know, that type of thing where you're playing bass lines with simple chords like an A. Again, that was in masterclass number, whatever it was. That was called Let's Rock. Um, I did a thing by Genesis called The Cinema Show. Um, I did it a while ago and it's a really tricky little piece to play and I did it on the 12 string and what makes it even more tricky is um, what have we got here let me just do I still don't play what I I know the notes on the fretboard and the notes on a page still don't play what I read well don't read it what you should do is just listen to what you want to do listen to what it is let me read some of these hang on let me have a look Right, uh, I'd like to say hello to Rich. Is it Willacy from from Canada? I tell you, it's brilliant getting all everybody from all over the world. Night the world. Nice to meet you, Rich. What else have we got? Dave Gray, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra play with all the, the yeah yeah, the movie blues for example. Yeah, I've come across many of your old videos. Have you ever made a tutorial? To time was Wishbone Ash. No. But I think the piece you're referring to, I've done one for, um, I did a one, I did one for, for uh, let me think, Wishbone Ash for those people in the States, a br brilliant uh, British band, I learned so much from them. Um, time Was was something that went. There was that one and. And then we actually, there's a, in fact, I'm not bragging, but that album behind, we had a few big albums in Japan in particular. On that album, even though it was, it, we were a, a young teen band, we did it, we, we were up, we were, whenever we played live, it was all rock music, you know, we were, all our records were like teen orientated, but we were actually, you know, a, a pretty good uh, rock band um, underneath the, um, the kicker boots and the, and the granddad shirts and all that sort of poppy stuff that we were, that we were I was going to say forced to wear we weren't forced to wear them at all we we, we embraced it because it was fantastic um, but we did um, the king will come which was uh, we used to open with it um, whenever we whenever we played but it's it was featured on that album on that gold album and I reckon that it's probably the only cover version that Wishbone Ash ever had, where it's done any, it's actually, you know, achieved anything. So, um, probably shouldn't have said that, because they'll be, well, actually, they can't get me for the royalties. RCA Records, or whatever they're called now. Sony Music, go, on, go and have a word with them, because they've got all my royalties as well, if it, if it helps. Right, so anyway, we did that. I did a version of, um, I, I did a remake of uh, This Guy's In Love With You, Bert Baccarat, beautiful song. You say there's God 
This guy's in love with you. We did that. If you haven't learned that one, go and do it because that is a beautiful song. Uh, for a joke, and it was a joke, Beyonce did this thing called Texas, Texas Holden. Uh, I didn't know what it was, but my, my, the lovely Lynn who you've just met, she, uh, she liked the song and she said, can you get your guitar to sound like that banjo at the beginning? So uh, I, I put some toilet paper over the strings and did a version of that for a laugh. So if you want to have a look at that, how, how to turn your guitar into a banjo using bog roll, then F Mr. Fenner will show you how to do that. Okay, we looked at that one. Fleetwood Mac, never going back again. Yeah, we've done that. I've done that a few times. That's a tricky one, that. But if you look at my video, I've, when I say I simplify things, you must understand, I don't make them, I don't change any of the notes. Because that would be sacrilege. It, that's, you know, you, when somebody writes a piece of music, you have to play it as they've written it. That doesn't mean to say that you can't explain it in a much simpler way and get the message across to people who are trying to play that, um, you know, that, that it's not as difficult as they think if you just break it down. So if you look at Never Going Back Again, and I've taught it to loads of people now, and once they get their head around the pick, you know, then they suddenly realise, hang on, I can do this. Because Never Going Back Again is one of those songs that the left hand is dead easy and the right hand is just a bit tricky with the with the picking but you you know you watch the video go back and look at the video it's a very popular one actually and um you you, you know you, you'll get it you know in no time if you watch my vid because all the paperwork's there for nothing it's all free i also did i had a look at the 12 bar blues again <laughs> You can't ever fail when you play that. If you play that blues riff, everybody just stops what they're doing and look as a good look. So we did that one. And then I did one, um, the masterclass number seven, which was stuff I wish I'd known years ago. And um, that was all to do with bar chords. Now, I've had a couple of people, this, today, some gentleman uh, got in touch with me saying that um, he wanted to know if you could get a particular device that you could put over your finger to to, um, to press the chord down well the answer is no you can't well, all you've got to do is it's let me I'll go over this again now because a lot of people struggle with bar chords and if you don't know them your, your repertoire is going to be limited you know to, to the point of Bob Dylan and Bob Dylan don't get me wrong Bob Dylan is great but even he when he learned bar chords the first thing he did is he bought an electric guitar you know up until then he was <laughs> down here as soon as he got his electric guitar it was okay so he put it to good use um so bar chords let's have a quick look at why you're struggling with your bar chords this is what you're doing wrong most of you for those who've never done one before you will look at your finger you'll see guitarists like me on the screen and you'll think that we're doing this and putting our finger flat like that and then putting the rest in. But let's just look at the bar. Let's not even look at the other fingers for a minute, okay? What you do is you use the side of your finger, this bit here, the bit that's all bony and hard, that bit there, the side, the edge of your finger, all right? Not the inner edge, this outer edge, the edge nearest to your thumb. And what you do is you hold it like that to the side. Uh, now, I'm gonna try and demonstrate this again. If, if I was to hold my guitar, like this outstretched it's heavy especially if you do it like that and you'll see that my finger and my thumb there's a lot of pressure that has to be applied there to keep it in, in position and can you see the way that my finger is naturally rolling to the side well that's the position that it needs to be in and you need to put a lot of pressure on a bar and you don't just put it the pressure on from from your left hand or your right hand if you play the other way around then what you you also have to do is with your arm on this part of your guitar, the body, you pull that back. So as you're uh, putting pressure over here, you're putting pressure here. So there's you end up with a sore neck because but there's a lot of pressure. I'm pulling. If I were, if I wasn't to hold this down here, my guitar would do this and spin off. Okay, so pressure, pull it together, pull it to your chest, and you'll get it. All right, bar chords, they're, and they're not. And the other thing you've got to make sure you've got, have you got the right guitar? Are you playing with a shitty guitar? Because, you know, there's that old saying where they always say, oh, a bad workman always blames their tools or whatever it is. And in the next breath, they say, you need the right tools for the job. So, you know, 
if you haven't got the right guitar, you, you know, you might as well forget it. There's a reason why John Williams, the classical guitarist, uh, spends 30 odd grand on a guitar. He doesn't buy it because it's hard to, you know, hard to play. He, buy, he buys it, so if you went, it would play a tune for him already. So, you know, he doesn't have to get veins in his neck trying to hold the chord down. So remember, a good instrument is important. Okay, and you don't have to spend a lot of money on a good instrument either. As I say, I've been in this game 50 years now. Did me first, and there's a story here. I did uh, my first gig in a place called the Wellman's Club, which was a little um, working men's club in, in Anglesey in North Wales. And um, it, was the it, was, it was the Easter holidays, 1974. And uh, it was a, myself and my little school band, we were called the New Attraction then, you know, because we did all the cabaret stuff. Uh, and you know, in the school holidays, we'd go off with our, our agent. It was a Welsh agent, and he, we were gigging in this this little place called the Wellman's Club. And I went back there with Lynn last week to see if it was still there. And it is. It was shut down, but I had a look through the window, and the little stage is still there. And all the silvery, you know, that silvery lemetery style uh, curtains that those old clubs had. That's still there. You know, so 50 years ago, I stood on that stage, doing my first gig for money. You know during the school holidays and it was a wonderful experience and it was fantastic a couple of years later we signed uh, the band had you know through doing those um, gigs and learning our trade we signed to RCA records and we um, we had a lot of hits in Japan so from playing at this little club in Anglesey I was then playing at the Budokan headlining with Buster which was the band and we did a couple of you know we were big we did a couple of shows in a day headlining and it's a I think it's a nine is it 9,000, 15, whatever it is? It's a big place. Um, the band that were on before us the week before was Fleetwood Mac and Cheap Trick and Bob Dylan, you know, and the Beatles had done it. So it was a big venue. That's how big we were when we when, when we got there. So in, the, in that space of two years, from 74 to 76, you know, we got to Japan and we watched ourselves arriving on the news back at the hotel on NHK. It was a big deal, you know. Um, so we really enjoyed that. But... Um, <coughs> Uh, there was a point I was going to make, I've forgotten what it was now. Um, it's all about, uh, remind me what we were on about, sorry I'm just looking at a question here to put me off. Everyone's hands are different. South Africa, well Dave Sutton from South Africa and John Robert, thank you John, $25, that, that's, that's lovely that, thank you very much. Now you haven't even asked me a question, you've just donated $25. So thank you very much for that, $25, thank you. Now I drink a lot of tea and coffee, all right. Okay, I drink a lot of tea and coffee. So all that money that you send me, the, the two quids here and there, it goes on coffee and tea and all that because I drink tons of it too much. So anyway, within the 50 years of, of, of that, the, the, the two years that we had uh, doing the working men's clubs and the miners clubs and all this sort of stuff, it put us in good stead to, to, to get on to um, to get a record deal and to move on and I've been signed to a few labels in my time you know uh, and don't forget this is a guy that couldn't read a note of music I can't read a note um, but we knew how to play all of us we were, we were a good little band um, Buster was the name of the band if you go on YouTube and have a look you'll find loads of stuff some of it's funny you know you'll be surprised but there's some live stuff on there when we were playing for NHK I think there's some Budokan stuff on there as well you know but we did that and we did the Opera House in um in Sydney, you know, uh, we didn't. We, we weren't inside the Opera House. There was a thing called the the Festival of Sydney, which is still going now, I think. But it was a big concert. They have a big concert on the steps of the Opera House. ACDC had done it the year before, and name dropping. Um, and we were invited to do it because we'd been on a show called Countdown, which was a, a big pop show in Australia with M Molly Meldrum. We'd had a, a, a hit over there in, in Australia, and we went off to a place called the, the uh, Keppel Island on the Barrier Reef to make this pop video, which was great fun. Nobody told us about um, about having sort of any sun protection, by the way. Nobody mentioned that uh, those four little scallywags from Liverpool may burn in the uh, in the hot Australian sun, which we did. Uh, so thank you for not mentioning it. I'm sure it was a good laugh, but we got burned to death on the beaches of. Uh, the barrier reef so I'll always remember that we had blisters like this honestly you know but that was fun um, EMI followed we signed to Parlophone then you know the Beatles label they were relaunching the label and uh, my band then you know we, we disbanded as Buster you know all still good friends but we disbanded and myself and my brother Al then uh, signed to uh, to EMI 
as alternative radio and we still play as alternative radio we still do the occasional live gigs usually just at christmas now because we're lazy and we can't be arsed running around all the time doing it but we still play and we still make records i'll make some great solo albums and i'm in the middle of doing another solo album myself and we still play a lot of stuff together did a live album last year um now let's have a look at this somebody's asked me a question about kev reinhardt hi kevin and john robert yep kev reinhardt thank you for that let's keep looking again no questions you know it, why is it that the people that put the most money in never ask a question thank you very much for that um but feel free to ask us whatever you like oh wait i've got one here thank you for all your free content you're welcome kevin you're welcome for me it's all about giving a bit back i've had a good career in music 50 years and i love every minute of it um it's enabled me never to have to have a proper job you know i've never had a proper job nobody would have me i mean that you know the idea of of going to work and being told what to do by some bloke in a suit with a side part and bad breath would not appeal to me so that i wouldn't have lasted five minutes all right I, you know i had a couple of little jobs when i was somebody's asking what you know what i did i had um when um just before we signed our deal to rca the two of the lads were younger than us they were still at school me and pete lay he's uh, was my best friend lovely pete lay um we had to find a little we fact decided to find a little job before we um be, you know to earn a bit of money while we went for the other two to leave school um so i got a job as in it well i had two jobs first one was on a uh, delivering fruit and vegetables on a on a, a green grocer's van that lasted uh what's that what's that? i'm just looking at the thing oh yeah cool i said what's your idea for two hour pricing yeah i'll have a look at that oh thanks lynn lynn's great because she's looking at these questions yeah, um more, uh, i'll check them out Tyler. thank you yeah i'll have another cup of tea Do I have, can i have a cup of coffee yeah. we've got to get let's get the priorities right eh, before we continue with this saga names question yeah there yeah, we go thank you okay i've got you yeah i'll get to john roberts in a minute john's asked me about um about practicing every day a couple of hours into 30 minute sessions i'll get into that in a sec uh i forgot what i was saying now i tell you what i'm sure my brain's going um i'll talk about john's thing for a minute um what is your idea for uh, two hour practice every day cut into 30 minute session well this is the thing about practicing and i mean this sincerely you can only practice really when you're enthused about what it is what piece of music you're actually working on okay if you are working on a piece of music that you really want to play you know you'll practice four or five hours a day if necessary you know um what i would suggest you do though is don't overdo it because you can actually hurt your hands you know people don't realize that when you you know guitar playing it's it's a sport you have to treat your hands as you would any other sport you know and if you over, try and overplay uh, you, you will damage them i remember when i was trying to learn cavatina which is a great a classical guitar piece and it's very demanding on the left hand right hand's easy but anyone that knows how to play it or has tried to play it will know how tricky the chord uh, inversions are that's why it's grade eight and i was working on this piece over and over and over again and i actually damaged the uh, tendon in my in one of my finger and every time i tried to to uh, to press a chord down it sent like a shot wave up my arm and it was frightening because i thought well i've ru i've ruined my career this is about 20 years ago and the doctor just said well you told him how i did it and he just said well don't stop you just don't play you know because you've got like a sports injury and I, you know and I said, well, I'm a guitar player. He goes, well, it's, you know, it's sport, isn't it? It's the same thing. So whatever you're doing, don't overdo it. Um, practice as much as you can. You know, classical guitar players have to practice a lot more than than, uh, than anyone because, you know, there's it's a different... I mean, classical guitarists, it's a different beast. It's so much more difficult and complicated. And, you know, the skill level involved in, in mastering classical is, a, is a, in a different league it really is there's a reason why classical guitarists on the whole don't play any other style and that is in order to be as good as they need to be if they want to make money from being a classical player they haven't got time to learn any other style it's the only style they will ever learn to play um they don't want to damage their their nails uh, you know whenever i'm playing classical guitar you'll notice i've got no nails uh, and every time i've tried to grow them somebody will say can you play you know 21st century schizoid man and within five minutes all my nails have gone you know so you can't do it so john uh you practice as much as you can let's have a look at some of these other questions that we've got going 
let's see what we've got. Um, Stuart wants to know, do I ever get the ukulele out? Well, I do sometimes, but I don't like putting guitar players off. I like this. What should we play? I never thought I'd miss you Half as much as I do So anyway, I'm not going to bore you, I don't want people to run off But yeah, play the ukulele The ukulele was the first instrument I learned to play when I was five years old And that was 60 years ago Okay, because I started when I was five and I got onto guitar when I was about seven All right, Kevin has asked, could you do a quick intro on Rider White Swan? I need the other guitar Stay with me Stay with me. I've just changed the string on this. I've lost one about. Stay with me. There's, a, I've just, there's another cup of tea. It's just arrived. Here we go. Just let me do this tune. Somebody wants Rider White Swan. Yes. The, the late, great. And I mean great. The late, great. Mark Bolan. Now nobody plays Rider White Swan like as I'm going to do it now. No one. No one. Not even Bolan. And I'm doing it on this guitar to show you what I mean. Okay. So I'll cap it with the fourth fret because that's what Mr. Bolan does. Forgive the tuning if it goes out of it. But as I say, it's a bit buzzy. Who cares? It's live. Ready. In the sky we ride it on out like a you work bird flying on out like an eagle in the sunbeam riding on out like a you were a bird Ride a white swan. I better cut it to keep them short because you never know. If you've got any tunes out there you want me to have a go at, if I know them, of course I'll give them a bast. Right, let's have a look. So that was for Kev, Ride a White Swan. What's this one? cat named dog do you do I know Steve how's the clap no I don't I love the track I did mood for a day which I think is harder to play than the clap because it's more classical so if you have a look on my vids I can't play it now because I've forgotten how to do it but it was one of the first things that I, I uploaded so look for mood for a day it's on the Fenner Rob channel it's one of the early ones probably had about 30 views because I'll tell you this is what I don't get all the stuff that I play right that's dead hard dead hard no bugger watches you know, all the stuff that I do that's relatively easy, everybody watches. You know, like uh, Hotel California, I've got a quarter of a million nearly watching that. You know, um, I mean, it's not easy to play, but it, it, compared to, the, to these other things, it, it's, uh, it is. Um, I don't know why that is. I'm trying to show off there and no one's, no one's, no one's watching. Great. Uh, what are the benefits of a seven string guitar? I've no idea. I've no idea. I mean, people struggle enough to play with six, so I wouldn't even bother with the seven string guitar. I don't see the point. Have you, you know, how's that going to work? Nah, for me, load of, load of um, I was going to say bollocks. Well, I will, I'll say it's a load of bollocks because it is. Right, let's have a look at some of the other things. Um, how did you develop your tablature? It's a game changer. I am, well, it's not tablature, it's, it's what I, it's my idiot proof way of doing it. Hold on a minute, I'll grab one. Um, What's this? So somebody asked me to do, for example, Jack and Diane. I haven't put it up because I don't know whether it'll be very popular. But you see the way I do it. I actually make it simple so you can't cock it up. It's impossible to cock it up. You know, you've got to be... I call it idiot-proof because if you can't follow it, then there's something wrong with you. All right? And I do these for me. So when I say idiot-proof, don't take offence. And, you know, these are, I do these things for me. I develop them. So I wouldn't forget because tablature doesn't tell you only it tells you, you know, what the strings are and what what frets they're held at. It doesn't tell you how to do it. it. Doesn't tell you where you put your fingers. You know, you, you've got to work that out for yourself. There's another one I'm working on. See this one? This is a tricky little bugger. Uh, um, Stephanie by Lindsay Buckingham. You know. Now I'm going to put that up at some point soon. Uh, they're ones that I've done for me or for some of my students, my private students because I teach privately, you know. And by the way, I do have a few slots left. People have been asking if you want to do private lessons, and I do them from all over the world now, Australia, Spain, 
all over the, uh, the states so you know um, and we do it on zoom and it works brilliantly it's just like me talking to you now only you'll be talking to me at the same time I'm learning whatever it is you want to learn that's the thing about the one-to-one -one. I can show you exactly what you want to do um, exactly what you want to do there isn't anything we can't do uh, so uh, that, the tablature thing um, I developed that for myself um, now somebody else contact me about what sort of capo should I get for my guitar well the the, the little clampy one these aren't bad these are like you know automatically clamp like this they're quite expensive this one doesn't belong to me somebody left it in my studio downstairs so you know if whoever it was that did it I've got it it's this one here all right the best ones I think are these they look a little bit cruder or the more crude or whatever you pronounce it and it's got the little screw thread there and then that way you can really get the, the right amount the other ones that clamp on with a the spring they are absolute crap don't buy them they don't work um, now if you're playing a 12 string guitar then you'll need one that's wider here if you're playing a classical guitar because you can get them for classical guitar even though most classical players of any notoriety would not use one um, unless they're doing like Rider White Swan on it yeah, it would have a it's nice and flat and of course if you're going to get one for a, a six string electric which you can do status quo and all that use them all the time as did Mark Boland then you'd use something like that you see it's got a slight curve on the neck so it's quite important there are different capos for different uh, types of guitar um now the big question i get asked all the time i've gonna I'm, i keep banging on about it music theory i'm gonna give you a bunch of names hopefully you'll have heard of them tommy emmanuel les paul eric clapton paul mccartney john lennon george harrison david gilmore jimi hendrix Django reinhardt me <laughs> Not that I would look myself in. One thing they all have in common, and you know what I'm going to say. You know what I'm going to say. Not one of them can read a note of music. When I saw an interview, Dave Gilmore, uh, it's a couple of years ago now. I think you still see it on the internet. He was. They were talking about where did you learn all your scales? You know, because he's a masterful, beautiful lead guitar player. And he said, um, I don't even know what a scale is. He goes, I clearly must know that in my head. But you know, I wouldn't really know what the name of it was. I just play. I know what the key is, and I play what I feel is right, and um, and that's it. Again, because he's a composer, he's not uh, he's not really thinking about um, playing the scale for the sake of it. He's thinking about trying to create a melody to complement the song that they've just done. All right, because that to me is what guitar playing is. It's all about complementing the song that you're gonna that you either you're gonna write yourself. Or, you know, if you're playing a, a Beatles song, every solo that's in a Beatles record, they're not whizzing up and down the, the neck like an idiot. That You know, it's an extension of the song. The melody is an extension of, of the song. You know, when you listen to the great solos, I mean, Eric Clapton, for example, probably, <laughs> ironically, there are two um, electric guitar lines that he's famous for. One is Layla, you know, the one that goes... Um, that one well he didn't write that I think it was a guy called Dwayne Allman wrote that who was in his band so people attributed that that for uh, to Eric Clapton he didn't even write it which is why when um, I think he got sued for some royalties at some point allegedly um, but I think that's why he never used that particular riff when he did the unplugged version because it's a, I would have bought the record and probably did just for that guitar riff so the and the other uh, riff that he's famous for um, Clapton was the you know whatever it is I don't like that song but you know it's so simple I you know I, that, that, it's, it's the sort of thing I teach my students you know when they were first wanted to play lead guitar and they're the two things that he's that he's mainly famous for I, I know that he's famous for lots of other bits and pieces and, and all that bluesy stuff but if you're looking at record sales they're the two that's made him the most dosh all right so you know the important thing is it was an extension of the song the great guitarists never overplay they know you know it's like any art if you're a chef you don't put too much food on the plate if you're a painter or an artist you don't put too much paint on the canvas you know if you're a musician you know where you've got to know where to leave space if you don't leave space then nothing's going to happen you've got no room to do anything else it just ends up as a big cluttery horrible mess right let's have a look at some more of these questions what have we got here 
Uh, what is the hardest song you had to figure out to do a tutorial on? Ooh, um, well, they're all well. It, any nothing really. I mean, it's, I suppose a tricky one. Um, I've got a guitar, and I'll show you one. It's uh, this guitar I've detuned a little bit. Um, whenever you're playing a song, say you wanted to play some, something on your own without that, without a band, then you have to uh, embellish your performance in order to con the listener that, that you, you, there's more of you than, than there are. So, for example, the tricky one was. Um, should know it already. I'm not in love, so don't forget it. It's just a silly phase I'm going through. And just because I called you up, don't get me wrong. Don't think you got it made I'm not in love Oh no It's because I put a bit of echo on that I was working on that earlier for someone So that's tricky because It's one of the big produced records You know as in huge production value That 10cc did so you've got to try and get the little bits in. Like in the middle of that song it goes Ooh, you wait a long time for me And I like to get those da da dam da da you know those little bits that are that they don't play when they do it live. You know, I'll, I'll try and get my can you get my hand in shot up on a minute. Let me see. Can you see it? So Ooh, you wait a long time for me. Upon the wall It hides a nasty stain It's lying there So don't you ask me To give it back I know you know it doesn't mean That much to me I'm not in love I'm not in love We end it. So that's one that's quite tricky if you want to do it as a, a solo piece because some of the chords, you know, you've got to get your thumb over to play some of those fiddly bits, you know. Um, but I don't know, I've been teaching on and off since 1979. Uh, Whenever things have been quieter on the live front or we've had a break from making albums, I've always enjoyed um, doing this, you know, like as I'm doing now. I like the challenge. I like it when people come along and say, hey, Rob, I bet you can't play this one, you know, um, and then I'll say, OK, well, let's give it a let's let's see what we can do and give it a give it a bash. Let's have a look what else we got coming down here. Um, Thanks, Steve. Fab version of Not In Love. Uh, no doubt we'll be playing that one next time then. Um, Steve's one of my uh, wonderful students, by the way. Um, I made Oh yeah, Neanderthal Man. Uh, that, that was by a band called Hot Legs, which was basically 10cc, with one of the guys missing. 10cc for me were one of the, um, the greatest bands ever. I had one opportunity to go and see him. I was working in a recording studio. It was uh, it's called Morgan Recording Studios. We were making an album and they were playing. This was about 19, I don't know, 78, 79 or something. And um, I was in the studio with, we just finished a session and uh, 
our producer and he was a, he was a songwriter Steve Wolf he's a great great I learned so much of Steve Wolf um, he, he was uh, they were also writing and producing for Bonnie Tyler at the time um, and Bonnie had just finished a track called Heaven um, which was on I think it's on one of our greatest hits albums it was a hit somewhere in the world I think it might have been in June so I ended up rather than going to see 10cc Steve asked me he said would you mind giving us a hand to do some of the backing voices on this Bonnie song you know so um, I did that where I stayed behind and did the uh, and ours on that so if ever you listen to that song by Bonnie Tyler called Heaven it's on their greatest hits album then the little ooze and ours in the background is yours truly and the late great Steve Wolf alright but that's why I never got to see 10cc <laughs> never mind but um, they played well uh, Graham Gullman he played recently up I think in uh, in New Brighton, Florida Pavilion, which is just down the road from me, wonderful theatre, which I uh, I play there every year. We're playing there again in live wise, by the way. We're playing there again in December. When I say we, me and my dear brother Alan, who is a wonderful percussionist, but don't tell him I said that. You know, he's a great percussionist. He he saw his ass recently when um, I bought this guitar. Yeah. I bought one of these. Now you'll have seen me arsing around with this. It's called, a, you've seen me playing it. It's a Vox Apache. And I went into the rehearsal room one day and I said, Al, you know, he said, do you mind if I uh, shoot out for fire? I said, do what you like, don't matter. You can do what you want. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know. The song we did called There Is No Indispensable Man, you know, it, this is where it comes into effect. I said, your services are no longer required. The drummers are no, neither, no longer required. And he said, uh, that's a complete load of bollocks, you know. You, no band can survive without a drummer. And I just went au contraire. And I did this. And I did this. And he stood there for five minutes doing this. And I laughed. All right, so this is a Vox Apache. This is the best little party piece of guitar you'll ever see. I bought them. God, I'm a, well, actually, this one doesn't belong to me. It belongs to another good friend of mine, one of my other wonderful students, Mr. Brian Real, who very kindly lent me this years and years ago. Because I lent him a Hoffner violin bass, and he's lent me to let me borrow this because uh, it's great on a serious note. It's great to keep your time in, you know, if you're practicing, you know. It's great to keep in time with, and it's got all sorts of, you know, cool and wonderful, you know, bit of what's this. Nile Rogers there you know but you can have fun with it you know if you were at a gig and you dug this one out you know even if you can't play that well you're gonna bring the house down anything and you can plug it in it's got an amp it's called so you can see it it's called a Vox Apache all right made by the famous you know the, the Vox thing that uh, you can get them on uh, I think you can get them on eBay you can pick them up they're not cheap they're not cheap though they, they've gone up uh, I think since people like me started playing them and going on about them I think they've sort of gone up in level you couldn't give them away at one time but then again once people start playing them and showing what they can do then um, that you know that they, they suddenly realize oh, Christ imagine taking that to a Christmas party you know you'd have a field day Lynn McDermott ah, this is my my lovely Lynn I saw 10 CC four times at the Liverpool Empire in the 70s love them you bloody traitor <laughs> Yeah, I didn't know Lynn then, of course, at the time. Uh, what are we? Do you make a re uh, did you make a rehearsal for, from from Salisbury Hill? Do you mean did I do a tutorial? Uh, I did a I did play Salisbury Hill for you. I've done a I've done a tutorial for the first bit. Um, in fact, I played it on the twelve string if I remember rightly with my fingers, which bloody hurt. Um, 
And again, if I get enough, I, I put the whole song on, on, on the, in my idiot proof way, but I didn't do a tutorial right the way to the end because uh, it's a long piece and I wanted to see how many people looked at the first piece. So clearly enough people haven't yet looked at it. But if I get some interest in Salisbury Hill, or you, you know, if you want to learn the rest of it, come to me privately. All you, you know, all you gotta, this is the thing, anyone out there is watching this, you know, just get in touch with me privately because, um, and then we, I'll teach you whatever you want. You know, um, I only tend to put up the stuff on, on the channel that I know is going to be quite popular, you know, because obviously I don't want, I can't put elitist stuff on too much, even though some of it is brilliant, um, because a lot of people will just tune off and, and, and run away. Um, now, I, now uh, uh, Frederick Wilson has said, any Jim Crochet classics? Well, yeah, because I've done a, I did a tutorial um, for a beautiful song called um, Time in a Bottle. If I could put time in a bottle. I've done that one. Uh, so please have a look. As again, there's 300 videos I've put on. And they've all got that idiot proof paperwork with it. All of them have got paperwork. So go and have a look at it. Dig it out, please. You know, it's all free. You don't have to spend anything. Uh, <laughs> Here's Andy Riley. Sorry, Andy. Andy, I re Andy again, uh, a wonderful student. You know, I forgot he played the drums. <laughs> it's only a joke, isn't it? That's good fun. Uh, what else have we got? Every Breath You Take, what a great tune, yet it certainly is. Um, I'm glad you like the simplified version of that. Um, there's a useful email in my inbox, I'll have a look at that later. What else have we got? Ronnie Lane is fantastic, yeah he is. Uh, what else have you? Cat Stevens, I've done Cat Stevens. Um, you know, it, what's the one he does? Um, let me show you something while we're on. Because you talk about Cat Stevens, in the intro to Cat Stevens, it's it's such an iconic little thing, and yet it's used in thousands of songs. Let me show you how to do this. Say you're playing the chord, now you must play your chord G. People say, why do you play a G like this? Da, 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 as opposed to this. Well, if you do it this way, you can't, you've got no fingers here to do anything with, all right? You've got a little finger that's stuck out here doing bugger all. That's no good, okay? So, we play a G like this, and... gives you lots of stuff that you can do, lots of little bits and pieces. Now, the Americans use this all the time. Third finger there. Don't bother putting your uh, your second finger on the fifth string of the second fret. What you do is just allow your third finger to just mute the fifth. It'll wanna do it anyway. So, so we've got that. Now with these two fingers, we're gonna put them on strings two and four, as if we're playing the chord C, all right? And this is a G over C, or whatever they order C over G. Again, my theory, theory is shit, but you know. What does it mean in practice? Get these two fingers and put them on here when I tell you to do it, all right? That one there, and that one on the fourth string of the second fret. It looks like a C. C is like that, but we're gonna keep these two fingers in place here. And I want you to do this. I want you to count it like this. One and two and three and four, and one and two and three and four and. And every time you say the number two, and four, you will put those two fingers on those two strings like that. Only when you say numbers two and number four, all right? So one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And if you do that, you'll get this sound. Slip sliding away. Slip sliding away You know the near your destination The more you slip sliding away Or you could do David Bowie Eileen's pretty neat, how is he to meet? It gets a bit high so I'm not going to embarrass myself Or you could do Cat Stevens Now there's another little couple of notey buttons in there. You can do this. It's not time to make a change. Just relax, pick it easy, la da da. I don't know the words, but I think Cat Stevens is absolutely wonderful. 
Anthony Ward, thank you so much for your $9.99. Finger picking for the song Ride On from the. Uh, I don't know that one. Christy Moore, I probably know the tune. If, if Again, if people, whenever I don't know them, if I'm doing these things privately, I'll look it up on YouTube. I'll go da 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 da. And within a few minutes, we'll have a rough idea of where it goes. Within five, another five minutes, we'll have it written down. And within 15 minutes, you'll be playing it. All right. That's how it works in my round hour way. Um, right, so what else have we got? You talked about the uh, right tool for the job and it don't have to be expensive. And then you lost your way. Ah, thank you. Thank you. I'm getting old. Right, yes, now that is a really good point. So thank you so much for Christopher. Thank you for, uh, for pointing that out. Um, now, when I was in RCA, in Curzon Street in London, as I said, we used to go down there, there used to be a guy that came in. Now, there's a gentleman, some of you guitar players will know him. His name is Paul Brett. And Paul Brett is a brilliant 12 string guitarist from, uh, from, from here over uh, in England. I think the gentleman lives in, I think he lives, I don't know, is it Wales or somewhere around there? But when we were in RCA to, to see our A&R man, Paul, who used to make these great 12 string guitar albums, and he was signed to RCA as well. And we sort of got to know him, you know. And we all looked up to this fella because Christ, he, did, he, was really, he played this guitar wonderfully and he used to use his fingers to play it, which was quite unique because as anyone will know, it's hard enough to pick on a six string, let alone a 12. But Paul used to play these things and he, when he used to go into the A&R and he never played a demo, he, he'd get his guitar out of his case and, and he'd play it and we, were, we could hear him from the other room playing this wonderful stuff to... Uh, Alan Size, I always remember the gentleman's name, the A&R man at RCA at the time. And he'd play this thing and, and we got to know him and we said to him, we said, um, could you, what, what guitar, what 12 string guitar have you got? Is it a Gibson, is it a Guild, you know? Or, or you know, is it? And he said, no, it, it, it's a K. And now we all knew that K, a K guitar, was the sort of guitar that you got, that your mum got for you on, on a catalog, you know, where you pay two pound a week and a K guitar was about 30 quid or something, and that, that was a lot of money then. But we sort of laughed at him and said, you know, <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's a card, this fellow, he, a K guitar. Come on now, but what do you really play? You know, Gil, Gibson, be honest. And he, he said, it's a K, and he went to his guitar case and he dug it out of his case, and there it was, it was this K guitar, which it cost him about 20 quid, what his mum, and, he, and we had, I, he let us have a go on it, and it was the most beautiful guitar to play and he said you know he goes these guitars normally they're not very good in fact they're shit he goes but i just got a good one i, I just got a good one and uh i i can't i, I was in touch with this uh, gent with paul about a year ago just to say hello and i happened to say to him i said have you still got that k guitar that you showed us in the uh, in rca all those years ago and, and he said i have he goes and i still play it now you look up Paul Brett, he's got, I think vintage, he's got his own or one of the top brands, he has his own um, named guitar. It's a Paul Brett 12 string. So um, you go and check that gentleman out because uh, if, if you're into 12 string guitar, I think, I'm, is it vintage he's got the, uh, but he, he, he's got a range of guitars in his name because he's that good. So if you play 12 string guitar, you check out his name, Mr. Paul Brett. Right, uh, thank you for reminding me of that Christopher. I thought I was going nuts, well I am. It's an age thing. Uh, what else have we got? Would love to see you uh, oh, uh, drift away. Which one's that? Um, I'll have a look at that, John. Uh, Jeff Page, what have we got? Oh, the Faces one, yeah. But that's a simple one, eh? Um, um. I wish that I knew why. There's only two chords in that, you got a D, right? This is the Ronnie Lane one. There's mandolins and all that enhancing it. But there's your there's your D. If you want to play the next chord, take this first finger and quite simply put it on the fifth string. And that's an E minor seven. Well, when I was younger, I wish that I knew what I know now. Well, when I was younger. And so it goes on. Great, great song by the Ronnie Lane. Why is it great? Because it's simple, and we all remember the melody, and because it's simple and the chords are simple, it enables guitar players or mandolin players to put all their beautiful stuff over the top. Okay, we always remember the great 
players, the great players, do not overplay. They leave space. They know when to shut up. The great chefs know when not to put those potatoes on the plate when the asparagus will do quite nicely. The paint, let's, do you remember as a kid, we used to have a thing called plasticine, you know, and it came in all brightly colored strips. You might have called it, I don't know whether you called it Play-Doh in America or anything, but you know, when you're a kid, you know, it was like, you know, you'd make models with it. And you know, within a day, if when you mixed all the, the, the colors up, it just looked like a dog turd, you know, with bits of hair in it. it and that's, and music's like that. It, you know, if you mix everything up too much, you all you end up with is a pile of shit. I'm sorry to use that word, but that's what it sounds like. You know, I know this from experience. You know, you put too much on and you end up with a cluttery mess. Space. Work out your parts, lay the parts down and leave the space for the other instruments in your band. Again, I, I cite football as um I look upon a great band like a great football team. You've got your you've got your your centre forward, you know, the one who gets all the glory. Well that's your lead singer, right? You've got your, your wingers in football. That's your sort of, you know, your lead guitar player. That sort of wishes he was the lead singer. But he still gets enough girls and he gets enough credit, you know. So they're like your wingers, you know. Then you've got your mid-range in your football team. They're like your rhythm guitarists and your, you know, and, and your keyboard players. They don't really get that much attention. There. But they're the ones keeping everything going. They're keeping the midfield going. They're keeping everything steady, you know. Down at the back, you know, at the back of the field, you've got the goalkeeper. People can't even remember his name. He sells the fewest shirts in the team. And, and, and the, the, the defenders, well, they're like your bass player and your drummer, you know. Now, the irony is, those, they're the two instruments, the bass player and the drummer, that if you, and I shouldn't say this in front of drummers and bass players, but if you didn't have them, you ain't got a band. If you've got a shitty drummer and a shitty bass player, you have not got a band. It doesn't matter how good the singer is or how good the guitar players are, if the bass and the drums aren't solid and tight, you've got nothing. All right. So think of it like a football team when you're in a, when you're in a band. It's very important, you know. I mean, we learned all this stuff I'm blabbing off about now. This is the stuff that I was over the fifty years, you know, that we were taught. We know when I joined the group, I was, uh, you know, I was only f fifteen, and and there were no all my mates at school. They weren't interested in. Well, some of them were. Some of them went on to be in a great band called OMD. You know, Orchestral Manoeuvres, wonderful band. You know, and they'd admit themselves that they were quite limited in what they knew playing wise. But bloody hell, they knew how to write a hit song. <laughs> You know, they're still touring now. The wonderful songs, beautiful, beautiful songs, uh, and I have the utmost respect for them. You know, uh, OMD, great, great English band, currently on tour. If you get a chance to go and see them, you go and see them. But when we were at school, um, it was all about, uh, you know, there were certain things that we weren't allowed to say when we when we were being managed. We, you know, our management team said, "Well, look, lads, you know." We'd say, we hope when we get, and they'd say, you don't say hope. You know, hope was a word that we weren't allowed to use. We weren't allowed to use the word if. It wasn't if, it was when. If we ever get a hit, no, no, when you get a hit. So it was instilled in us at a young age. And I'm saying this now because if you've got youngsters out there that, that want to get on in the music business, you've got to sort of, you know, they've got to have that self-belief. And in a way, it sort of borders on arrogance in a way. You know, you've got to have that self-belief it, uh, that to, to say you know I'm going to do this I don't care what you say and you'll know and you know when you hear this thing how the hell did he get to the top he's crap and I heard some fella in the substation could play a million times better than him well you're probably right the guy in the substation probably could but what the other guy or girl did to get famous is they had the tenacity to keep going when they were told they were shit and they just carried on and there's an old saying in our country if you throw enough shit at the wall some of it is bound to stick. And that's what happens. You just keep going and going and going and going. And you'll see that in any walk of life, doesn't matter whether it's um, even what's the name, well, you know, Albert Einstein, he was told he was a bit of a thickhead. Oh, you're just a patent clock, Mr. Epstein. What do you know about theoretical physics? He knew quite a lot, didn't he? You know, how many, Frank Whittle, he was shown the door. You know, the guy invented the jet engine. You know, the Beatles signed to a comedy label, for Christ's sake, a comedy label. Right, right. Ah, uh, oh, when? Date. Oh dear, no, oh, isn't that? I'm talking about the, the Paul Brett. I've just found out he passed away on the 31st of uh, January. Oh, how sad, That's, that, what a shock that is. Because he was a wonderful guitar player. 
Go and check him out as a tribute to the man. Listen to his records. Oh, thank you, Len. Oh, well, how sad that is. Paul Brett, the late great Paul Brett, and he was great. Um, oh, what a shame. Uh, right, uh, Andy said music exists between the space between the notes. It certainly does. Yeah, a lot of people tell me about Paul now. I didn't know that. I say it was about a year ago that we had a chat. What a shame. Um, wish I had headphones. Can't hear a thing in this house. Why? What's going on? Are you? Are you they listen. What are they watching on TV? William, William McCarthy. What are they? What are they doing, William? That's stopping you listening. Um, well, let's have a look. It's the singer, not the song. Cat named Dog. Christ, I feel silly now. <laughs> I don't know. I'm English. I don't know these things. Right, Derek from Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. How often do you have frets replaced? Not very often. Not very often. In fact, um, you, you, you'll have seen me playing an old my old Fender Telecaster. Uh, which I got when I was my dad bought it for me when I joined the band in 1975 I wanted a Gibson Les Paul but it was a bit out of the price range so he got me a Telecaster it's funny you know you know I always remember I, I was a big Mark Boland fan as a kid you know as a teenager and I used to watch him playing his Gibson Les Paul and I always wanted to be I, I wanted a Les Paul guitar and I wanted to be on the um, the EMI label you know and I ended, and, and I used to like Slade, but Noddy Holder had what I considered to be an ugly guitar. Yeah, Noddy Holder played Defender Telecaster, and it was quite ugly. Look, I mean Telecaster. Let's be honest, they're not the prettiest guitar. The headstock looks a bit deformed, but the Les Paul was elegant. And anyway, the upshot of it is, and I never wanted to be on the Orange label that the Sweet were on. Now the Sweet were a good band, but they were a bit too glam pop for me. I was more of a Boland fan and Bowie and that. So I never wanted to be on the orange label and I never wanted to get a guitar that looked like the one that Noddy Older had. So what happened, I ended up getting a Fender Telecaster like Noddy Older had, which turned out to be excellent by the way and I still use it today. And I ended up being signed to the orange label I didn't want to be on, which was the RCA record label, which I'm glad I, I was signed to it now because later in uh, mm. once we signed to it, we realized that David Bowie was signed to that label as was Elvis Presley and all the greats. So, you know, I changed my mind pretty quickly. Um, I did get to AMI in the end though. As I say, I got to Parlophone. But when the Beatles signed to Parlophone, it was a comedy label. The only records that came out on that label were, were joke ones, you know, like the, uh, the comedy trio, the, the goons and all that stuff. It was all, uh, so it was no accolade to be signed to that label in, in 1962. In fact, they were laughed at. Decca was the big label. You know, but I've been signed to them and we were signed to Pi. We've even made records for Liverpool Football Club, which was fun. That was a good laugh. Sounds like old kink style. What else have we got? Uh, would you recommend getting your guitar set up by Aluthia Rob? Uh, yes, I would. Um, we use a, there's a great one in the Liverpool area called KGB Music in Birkenhead. The, the chaps down there, they look after all my guitars. They do a fantastic job. In Crosby, there's a gentleman called Mark Reader, a good friend of mine. Um, and Mark, he looks after my guitars when he's got time. He's a busy man, he's a great musician. But uh, KGB in Birkenhead, which is in Pacific Road, they look after all my guitars now. And they do everything, they're brilliant, they're the best, for, in my opinion. So if you're on the world, that's where you, uh, you should get them. Or in the Liverpool area, that's where you get them done. Uh, let's have a look, would you recommend? Yeah, I would definitely get it done. Um, would you support Tramia Rovers? Well, Tramia are a Birkenhead team. You know, we all like to see Tramia doing well. Um, you know, th they did. They almost got in the league once, but they it, it didn't happen at the end. What else have we got? Uh, let's have a look. What else have we got? Hi, Rob from Brisbane, Australia. How important are one finger nails when it comes to learning finger picking? Ah, one's fingernails. Um, not that important, really. Um, the, the greatest classical player of all time is a gentleman called Tariga, or Tariga, however you pronounce it. And, uh, ooh, I've got water. Is my voice getting croaky? Croaky no, joke. I'll tell you what, I'll have a bit more coffee if there's one going. Thanks then. Okay. I'm being looked after. I've got a glass of water here with lemons in it. The lovely lid. Yeah. You know. Every time you go away. You take a piece of me with you. If you know, you know. If you know, there's a joke in there. Right. <laughs> See you later. Um, yeah, Terriga. Terriga. He, uh, the greatest classical player of all time, 
he uh, he did not he did not fingernails. He couldn't use fingernails. So uh, it, I think that the general consensus now is you need a little bit of nail, but not too much if you're playing classical guitar. Uh, other people um, swear by him. People like uh, oh, what's his name? Who did this song? I can't remember. It goes like this. You'll remind me. Remind me who did it. it Carol King wrote it, but who did? The, who had the hit with it? Um, And you need a helping hand And nothing, for oh, nothing is going right Who did that? James Taylor James Taylor James Taylor, uh, he can't play without nails He takes a little kit round, I watched him you know, and, and he has false nails And he makes his own nails out of He used to use ping pong balls, you know, for t table tennis balls and all that But you can actually buy them I bought some uh, a couple of years ago and I, I didn't read the, the, the instructions how you put these things on and I put them on with super glue folks put them on with super glue and guess what as soon as I started to play the with a plectrum the strings got behind the nail and ripped not only the false nail off but also my own nails which was extremely painful so I will never use them again okay apparently you're supposed to put your nails in this Solution and it melts them off. I didn't know anything about that. So I'm I'm sticking with the uh, the uh, Torriga thing whereby you know grow your nails a bit if you can. But if you're playing, if you get a classical player, you know you can't play any other style. Your nails will be gone within within minutes. If you look at my nail, don't really see it. You know it just it just vanishes as within you know minutes of playing electric guitar. It's just gone. James, Te yeah, James Taylor. Thank you for that. Um, let me have a look what else is going on here. Uh, yeah, 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 Dave Dave Grace just said, I just got my guitar set up, but it makes a difference, especially with bar chords. It, it really does. If you try and do a bar chord and the action on your guitar is too high, you forget it. My Taylor guitar, the one that you've just, this one here, I I, uh, I took a chance the other day. I, I had it, um, when I was do, when I do concerts now, I have it, I have it detuned by uh, two frets, so it's, it's uh, a standard D tuning, not E because my voice has got lower as I've got older. Um, so when you do that, of course, uh, then the, the tension on the neck needs adjusting. So I took it to KGB Music, the place I told you, and they did a great job and, and did it. Uh, anyway, I, I retuned it again to, you know, to um, standard to learn for, for some other stuff. So I, I, I took the chance of just adjusting the truss rod myself and I sort of knew how to do it a bit. So uh, I had to readjust it. But things like that, gauge of strings, but be careful doing that. Try not to do it yourself. If you do it incorrectly, you can break your guitar and you can cause real damage to it. So, you know, I know I knew enough not to smash it up. So, but if I was doing a bigger job, I would give it to an, to the experts to do. Um, as I say, KGB are the people that I use. I'm not getting commission off them, by the way. They're just good mates and they do a fantastic job. Uh, what else have we got? Um, is there any piece of music that you never tire of playing? And if so, why? Um, no. It's not one of the things. If you've got a wide repertoire of music, then you know, um, you know, you, you never get bored because you know so many things. I love, all, I love everything. You know, I, I like things that. <laughs> country music rock music pop music you know anything I'll, I'll listen to but the re again I go back to the reason I like the thing I like playing the most I like writing new stuff that's for me why I play the guitar I play the guitar to write new stuff and that's as, it's as simple as that I'm, you know I've got an album out I think uh, Junction 39 I think it's sold out now but you, if you look on my site robfenner.com you can hear some of it if you like it but it's all guitar oriented it's just me I play all the instruments on it my son guests on uh one or two of the tracks. My son Alan, who again is a fine guitar player himself, and he does some teaching. Um, so he guessed it on, and, and of course all the backing voices, all the backing voices, all the high bits. Um, Lynn did them. I heard her, and you know Lynn's not a professional singer, but I uh, don't tell her I said this, but I heard her doing singing along to the theme of Star Trek. Oh, oh that one, and she hit the last note. And she hit it, honest to God, it was perfect, and it's it's really high, that note. So, um, 
my search for backing singers ended and Lynn was brought into the studio and did the backing voices with myself but all the high bits all the beautiful high piercy bits Lynn did them not me she did and um, and she's going to be doing the next album as well we're in the studio making another one as we speak so uh, you look out for that but anyway it's called Junction 39 is the name of the album Junction 39 have a look out for that right let's have a look yeah Lynn's great um, yay we finally met Lynn yeah well everyone knows Lynn Lynn is the popular member when we do our tours our theatre tours because we're into we're writers and producers Lynn's a co-producer with me of, of, of you know proper touring theatrical productions you know um, big ones um, we're having a break this year because Lynn uh, you know you probably already know Lynn had a, a kidney transplant last year so she's taking it easy this year and I'm taking it a bit easy because I was the donor you know so we were both laid up last year for quite a bit so uh, it, well, that's why we're not doing as many gigs Every, we're both fine Lynn's great um, but we, we, we just want to concentrate on just playing for a bit and we're going doing a bit of work in the studio we'll be back next year doing all the touring stuff again with another show called Lennon's Banjo but for this year for those who ask which is why we're taking it a bit easier that's why um, which is why I enjoy doing this sort of stuff right what else have we got uh, good question da, 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 da. I set up my Martin with electric guitar strings um, thumb pick no I don't use them the reason I don't use a thumb pick, I know some people swear by them, but I can't use them. I always feel that when I use a thumb pick, because I've got no nails, then the the, uh, the thumb is always over, too overpowered and it just sounds too loud, you know. Um, when I play, um, let me just check this again. This guitar needs setting up. This is going to KGB. I've had this for years. I play it all the time. But say I was doing something like... There she is. If I'm doing something like that and I had a thumb pick, all you'd hear is... You wouldn't hear any of the... Here we are. How many have I got now, too? Well, I've cold. just been telling everyone about your, okay. your thing. Did you um, say shit then? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so Lynn, Lynn's got three kidneys, and I've got one. So that's why whenever she leaves the room, I say to her, "Every time you go away, you take a piece of me with you." There you go. So you're never going to get rid of me now. No. All right. Thank you. Right. Oh, let's have a look. What we got here? Okay. Hold on. Music man, I have the Junction 39 badge. They're great. Hey, listen, if you get in touch with me, I'll send you one for nothing. Anyone that gets in touch or watches the thing or, you know, does whatever they do, sends a super thanks, I'll send them a, I'll send them one of our little, the proper badges, not of your, your shit ones. These are proper metal ones. Beautiful little thing. Lynn, if you get a badge, bring us one up. If you're watching this, Lynn. Uh, let's have a look what we got here. Have you got a video on Angie? Now, which Angie are we talking about? Are we talking about... <laughs> Or are we talking about Was that which how's it go? How's it go? No, we haven't got one for Angie yet, but I will do it. I've been threatening to do it for years. For years I've been threatening to do it. I've written it out, but I just haven't got around to playing it. Maybe because I don't think enough people are interested in it. Maybe they are, I don't know. Uh, how do you start writing a song? You start by getting a nice chord progression going, and you don't play too many chords. You keep it simple. You keep it simple. You know, Pink Floyd, you know, watch, watch this. Here we are. See that? Where are we? Junction 39. See that proper, proper classy little badge that everyone that gets there buys their album. And they've almost gone now because it was a limited edition. It's coming out on vinyl. It's coming out on vinyl in about three three months' time. 
because it's a good it, I won't, I, I'm an old arse and I like vinyl and I'm fed up trying to read artwork it's on a poxy CD and I hate digital stuff I want it on vinyl I want to be able to read what's going on there's the little badge if you want one if you want one just get in touch and I'll get one to you all right you just keep watching my channel uh, in fact everyone that does a like or a share I'll get I'll send you one how's that I can't say further than that uh, what was it what was it talking about I've forgotten again I'm getting distracted you're all distracting me uh, oh yeah we were talking about songwriting sim simplistic stuff um, E minor two chords that he uses for the majority of breathe Roger Waters no I would teach this to a kid listen you learn you'll know it you know it's not one of the most famous albums ever been around where's it go D G7 he doesn't even play the whole G7 watch D G7 you ready Lunatic is on the grass. <laughs> the lunatic is on the grass. And so it goes on D. Move it up two frets. To an A seventh played like that. And then of course boom, all the other instruments come in and everyone thinks oh cry that's really complicated but really it isn't he's left they've left enough space in order for Gilmore and all the singers and all the keyboards to come in and fill the holes right what else have we got uh, how do you start writing a song we had a look at that I would love to hear an original song well I will listen to the album I'm, I don't want I won't do one now I won't do one now because I, I, I want you to listen to the album Junction 39 go on to robfenner.com well, go on to you listen go on to um google if you google my name rob fenner f-e-n-n-a-h the posh way with the <sighs> at the end um then you will see all the stuff that i've done i've done about 10 11 albums with buster and various you know guys but most of it's original music you know all of it is you know we've had like sessions of the year on radio one and you know we've been around the block a bit you know well i have i, I mean as i say bringing it back to the 50 years you know um christ a long time that isn't it 50 years and uh I don't, i'd rather not think about it but i still i'm for me i feel like i've only just started i always feel like i've got to do something else i don't feel like looking backwards i always we had a i i i uh our head my 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 old headmaster was a gentleman called mr crozier cliff crozier and he lived till he was 103 and uh in in later life uh, a few years ago when we were doing our tours and stuff you know we knew he liked the theater so we'd pick him up and 103 years old and uh, we we took him to the theater and we used to we used to ask him you know uh how he why he lived so long and he used to say i i uh because of course a lot of his family had passed away and even some of his, his children you know and he this gentleman under you know 103 years old, he said i never look back i always look forward because the, because you know I always try and find exciting and new things to look forward to you can't change anything that's already gone so I look forward and and that way you know uh, I try and find new things and exciting things to keep me keep me going well it certainly worked for him as I say he ended up at uh, 104 years old I think uh, Covid got him in the end the dreaded Covid you know but uh, what a guy he was you know some of the stories he had to tell of all those years you know um, but there we are right let's have another look at some of the other little bits that we need to look at while we're at it uh, let's just see uh, let's have a look Glenn Campbell isn't he fantastic you know now what a guitar player he was you know people remember him for Rhinestone Cowboy but I'll tell you what you listen to that fella playing the guitar he could he would blow us all off the stage um, uh, where are we uh, you know yeah vine, we're all into vinyl send a badge I'll get you one um it's it's a minor with an f sharp i don't know what that is breathe blatant rip off from down by the river uh what's this what's the best way to remember how to play a backlog of tunes you've learned okay well 
what you do is this is the truth i shouldn't be telling you the secrets of the trade but when we go on stage me and my dear brother al we will go on stage and we will make out that you know we've just walked on and we haven't we haven't played for a year and half the time we haven't because we're getting a bit lazy in old age but really what we've done is we'll have rehearsed for a week before so and, we, and because we're playing all most of whenever we do concerts it's uh, 90 percent of the material is our music because everyone over here knows us for our own albums and our own music you know um we, we do a couple of cover versions towards the end of the night if we're in the right mood but uh, majority of it is ours so clearly we sort of we we remember it because it's our own music however um the best way just generally to, to remember stuff is it, it's the lyrics of the song people uh, when you're learning to play and, I, and this is a serious point when you're learning to play if I was to play uh, you could be on a chord for a long long time and you you know you need to know when you're going to change that chord when does the next chord come in well it's a song remember that this thing here is secondary to the song this is accompanying the song the song is what you're going to sing right you're, you're going to sing the song now when the lyric changes that will tell you you that should remind you of what chord you should be changing to okay yeah so if, if i was doing that what was it we were doing before um down trouble need helping and the lyric will act as a prompt to tell you what to play all right but if you don't rehearse them beforehand you'll 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 never get them you know you'll you'll cock it up i mean the trick with all or we all do it we make out that we're just doing it and we are but we've rehearsed like hell you know you've really got to you know you've got to work hard you can't just get up and play i have to look at my own tutorial sometimes to remember you know the ones that you watch i watch them as well and i think christ forgot how to do that so i will watch this guy on the on youtube with a silly hat on and he talks all about his idiot proof way of doing stuff and you know what sometimes he really impresses me because i think that is really good that and i so I, I surprise myself that i had the patience to do it you know but it was during covid so i had nothing else to do uh, what else have we got? Where's my badge? Andy, you can have one when I see it on, uh, well, when, when you're next year, it's a couple of weeks. The de Detectorist theme, what's that one? Glenn Campbell, let's have a look what else we've got. Uh, where are we? Um, people are talking about that kidney thing. It's funny because I was doing, I did a few tutorials when I, I'd come out of Aussie, and I think I told you I had a cold, but um, <laughs> it was funny really. But, um, I, I thought you know what when I was in hospital and people will not um, they won't believe me when I say this but um, I actually I found it a very enjoyable experience even though it was painful because you know when you for the first time in, in, in your life you, you, I'm sitting there surrounded by people that actually give a shit you know because there's so many people out there that really don't you know and Lynn felt the same he had all these beautiful people from all nationalities all over the world and they're all there for you and and I will you know and for, be eternally grateful for that but um when I when when we came out um I came out the day before Lynn or two days before Lynn but I I, I needed to play my guitar I hadn't played it for a while but um I think I was I did a few two I think a couple of tutorials see how it went but um you know if you see me go Ugh! that's what it was right what else have we got uh writing song started with a circle well this circle of fifths thing you know i don't even know what that is you know i i know what it is you know but um forget about things like that think of nice chord progressions chord patterns just think of what you're going to do you know just pick something if you're going to say you i do this a lot say i'm going to play i'll do this i'll stick a capo on and i'll say and i'll just tool around i'll go Sunday morning, 5 a.m. Telephone, it rings again. One more early wake up call. My suitcase packed, it's in the hall. Another flight, another plane. Sleep around a midnight train. My paycheck 
is a souvenir I'll send with love to you, my dear I guess it's true what people say Absence makes the heart grow fonder day by day Will you hold me? I'll just make it up In your memory Touch my heart though I'm so Save one dream for me. Back to the riff. I'll do stuff like that, or what? You know, I just. I'm just messing around. G. G. And I think I told you before about playing your G like that, so you can use these fingers. Watch. These are that. This one is something I did for that play. I was telling you about. Something's across the mezzi. And then that provides the melody. Da di da 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 di da la da da ba di da 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 ba. You know, etc. You just keep it going and keep it going, and you find stuff, and you'll find the some of the phrases that you play in. They'll they'll. They'll remind you of um, the musical phrases. That is, they'll remind the words will sort of jump out at you to to, to, to fit the gap, and and then you'll think, well, that's a nice, uh, that's a nice title. And I, I remember I was doing a. Uh, the reason I got into this theatre thing, I was I read a book. I was given a book by an author called Helen Forrester. There was a book called Tuppence Across the Mersey. It was all about her childhood as a kid in Liverpool, riches to rags type of thing. And she described her father in this book, who was a clever, intelligent man who'd lost everything during the Great Depression, as a butterfly whose wings were beaten, useless by the rain. That's how she described her father. You know, everything worked, but he, he couldn't do anything, you know, because he's, he wasn't skilled. He was, he was a banker and he, and he was in Liverpool and his skills weren't necessary, you know. And she described him as a butterfly whose wings were beaten, useless by the rain. So my brother and I, we wrote a song called Butterfly in the Rain. And to me, it was just a beautiful image, you know. Um, it says everything. And, and we wrote this song based on this description of Helen's father. Uh, and we called the song Butterfly in the Rain. In fact, we had Rick Wakeman, the keyboard player uh, from Yes, you know, the great Rick, Rick. He played keyboards on it. We were in, I mentioned before about my friends from Orchestra Manoeuvres in the Dark. We were recording the, uh, the soundtrack to the album in the studio in a place called West Kirby on the Wirral. And... Uh, I uh, I said we're going to get a, a guest. We were doing some charity work with Rick Wakeman, and he was. We were both involved in the same uh, charity in, in in Liverpool. It was a Roy Castle charity. He was a famous actor over here, but he. Uh, I mean, it was a cancer charity we were working on, and we were donating the royalties for this particular track to this particular charity. And Rick Wakeman very kindly agreed to come and play piano on it. Now we hadn't told the guys from OMD. Now, for those people who know OMD, they'll know that they're a keyboard-based band. You know, we're guitar players. And they're keyboards, and I didn't play keyboards. So we got we we said to Rick, "Will you come and play uh, the piano on it?" So we'd arranged. We didn't tell the guys from OMD this because we wanted to surprise them. You know, Martin and Malcolm and Paul it was, and we told them that we're going to go and pick Rick up from the uh, from Liverpool airport, and they said, "You're going to the pub, aren't you?" You go to the pub. You're gonna leave us here. Well, you go and get pissed in the pub. In the pub, pissed being and getting drunk. You know. So we said no. We're gonna go and pick up the keyboard player. We're getting Rick Waitman, and they of course laughed at us and did yeah right yeah. Get us, bring us a packet of crisps when you come back. So we walked in a couple of hours later, and they said, "Where's effing Rick then?" You know. And Rick Waitman just sort of swole. He just came in majestically behind us. You know his long hair flowing, and he introduced himself. And they were like this, you know. They couldn't believe that their God, because he was their God, you know, he's the, you know, the keyboard player extraordinaire. And he sat at the keyboard, Rick Wakeman, their keyboard, and he sat there and he goes, how would you like me to play it, Rob? And I said, could you do it like you did on Life on Mars, you know, the Bowie thing you did? And he goes, yeah. And he did. And it was a song called Butterfly in the Rain. And if you check it out on the Alternative Radio album, you'll, you'll hear Rick Wakeman playing that particular song. But um, that's how songs are done. Get a good title and uh, you, you know words will present themselves to the song um, well you know I've just done an original song that was the, uh, that, the yeah this is for Brian that one I did called Save One Dream that was a big record on radio too gone hammered to death 
I made more money out of that song than all the others put together. Um, right, let's have a look what we've got. Um, these badges are looking pretty damn popular. Well, listen, anyone that comes to me for private lessons, they always get one anyway. Write and song, start off with a circle of fifths. Yeah, you can do all that sort of stuff, but just follow your instinct, follow the thing. Think of the melody. It's all about the melody, all right? Don't overplay. You know, th remember what we said about Pink Floyd, thank you, Ralph, for uh, pickers and players. What else have we got? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Andy, yeah. When you wrote Junction 39, we were at a low point. No. I was at a very high point. It sounds like you were reflecting on a career with a few regrets, but you told me, I don't have any regrets. I have none. I have no regrets whatsoever. You know, everything that's happened in my, I mean, I've done some daft things. I mean, I have, I've done some, and things, you know, things that, you know, but, and things that like, you regret, you know, you, you've upset people in your life that you wish you hadn't, you know, you, or you've, you've done things when you've had a few too many to drink when you're younger and you think, Christ, I shouldn't have done that either, but, you can't all you can do is try and learn from those things and not and not do them again that's what i think so regrets no um you know if i always look at it you know i've got a very happy life now with lynn and everything and my two brilliant kids and all that my sons and all and i've got great friends and i love what i do and i think well if things had been different or maybe i'd have had a bigger hit there or a bigger then i wouldn't have met the people i know now and you know i look at some people who become really really successful you know and you you think well they don't a lot of the time they don't seem all that happy i don't know if you've noticed that they all seem quite miserable you know elton john's always seems to be going on about you know he's had his fair share of trouble george michael you see a lot of these you know these these people and it's sad really consider that they're so talented and they become so successful and you think that they'd be more than happy and yet they're not i'll tell you a guy who i really respect pete best i am pleased to, to, to say that you know we got to know him quite well and look upon him as a friend Pete Best was the first drummer in the Beatles and um, before Ringo was in there and it was Pete Best if you look at the anthology he was with them when they were in Hamburg all those years ago and he was with them for two years and when they signed to a Parlophone Records um, he was unceremoniously kicked out of the group and was replaced by Ringo Starr you know and um, he never knew why and it really depressed the man you know and quite rightly you know you're, you're sitting there in 1963 64 right up to 1970 looking at this band that you'd spent two years with working your way up only to get booted out and nobody telling you exactly why you know brian epstein dragged him into the office and and uh, and, and just said the you know you're out and ring goes in type of thing but the nice thing about it is and i know peter now and his brother um rogue best and peter has got a beautiful family he's happy you know and he always says to me and, and to others that you know in a way um, everything that that he's that that's happened in his life was good because he's got all these and his you know his daughter his daughter uh, the, the you know and the relative the famous actresses he's had a, he's got a really privileged and happy life and the the the, the, the crowning you know the uh, the icing on the cake was when the anthology came out they featured the songs he played on the Beatles stuff that early stuff so people got to hear how good he was and he made some money from the Beatles so his legacy is intact but the nice thing is he, he didn't spend his whole life being miserable like a lot of these famous people are you know look at them they're either dead or miserable and you sometimes look at yourself and think well maybe it's better to just hover and get a good career without getting too high up that ladder right i'm going to do a few more questions and then i'm let you going to go to i'm going to let you all go to bed i don't know what time it is where you're watching it's about half past what time is it it's 22 uh it's quarter to 11 here in the night uh, and i've got to be up you know what i'm teaching in the morning at eight o'clock such as uh, in, in um, eight o'clock in the morning which is going to be fun um right when you wrote so no i wasn't junction 39 junction 39 the song is important the reason Junction 39, the Junction 39 song is about a chap. You know, I know people like this. They spend all their lives, and you will know people like this. They spend all their working lives busily going to work, going to the office, getting in their car. They've got the big house. They've got a, a holiday home. And guess what? They're never in it. They're never there. And, you know, and life's gone. And by the time they realise that, you know, what's going on they're too old and they miss it and junction 39 is a story about this chap that's in his car is in a traffic jam at junction 39 
and he relates everything. He looks around him and he sees these people in the in the cars really punching at their phones, you know, freaking out because they can't get to where they where they want to be. And he has it's an epiphany for him, and he realizes that he's got the house, he's got a beautiful wife, he's got everything, but the one thing they haven't got from him is the time. He's never there, you know, and he realizes at that moment that his future does not lie ahead at Junction Forty. It's back. Where he's, where he, where he should be. So, the song tells us the next opportunity. He turns around and goes home. So it's a nice positive ending. He finally realizes what's important in life. All right. How many people do we know that retire and two years after they've retired haven't worked their fingers to the bone? They they die. That's no way to. If you've got a bit of money, take my advice. You go and spend it. You go and spend it now. Enjoy yourself. What else have we got? Right, uh, Pete Best didn't fit in, but was a far better drummer. I wouldn't say he was a better drummer, he was a different drummer. He was a different type of drummer, you know. Um, that's what I'd say, I think, because Ringo was a great drummer for the Beatles, and when you listen to Pete, so was he. But when they started doing, it's hard to say what Pete would have developed like, you know, when, you know, benefit of Mr. Kite and all that stuff. But Ringo was one of these guys, he, he again, he played for the song. He, he wasn't a drummer that played to show off with the drums, he played what was necessary to make the song better and that's what was brilliant about him as a drummer and that's why McCartney is such a, an underrated and brilliant bass player he did the same the song always came first George Harrison never played yet never overplayed he played exactly what was necessary to make the song better it's all about the song all right could you uh could you do easy play uh could you do easy play of I don't know what that means uh, maybe it printed 7.42 a.m. in the morning where's that what, seven, somebody's just said it's 7.42 a.m. in the morning right what else have we got I think it's time to go right let's just have one final recap before we go before before we do remember thank you very much for sending those um, super chats or whatever they call it on the bottom left there's a little button there pays for my tea and coffee so all those people have donated thank you so much you can still do that if you want to do it and i'll and if you want to send me a message i'll answer you i'll always do that anywhere if i can i'll always do whatever i can to uh, to answer the questions that you send me um pete please feel free to share everything on my channel it's all free you know um everything's free i'm not bothered who you send it to the more people that look at it the better that's all that i care about that's the most important thing um and the next what am i doing next uh, the, well i finished doing the series of um super uh, of not super thing of the master classes the master classes I've, I've done eight now i suggest anyone that's a beginner to go back to number one work your way through the eight uh, i'll be continuing to re to put up new stuff every saturday um so you should be able to join in now because and I'll be doing things like I'm not in love and any suggestions that you've got that you'd like me to cover or any problems that you've got with any of the stuff then you know I'll, I'll go over it again with you because the channel is, is all about trying to help you to learn to play alright and learn to play better and you know and if you've got any youngsters out there um, that want to learn to play then all I can talk from it to speak to you about is my own experience and what's kept me in the business for 50 years you know earning a living out of it um, so I think you know I might not be able to read music but I know how to play it and uh, you can always get somebody else to uh, to score it out for you now again if you know anyone that can score my classical piece out then uh, let me know because I've not yet met anyone that can um, that can do it right on that note thank you so much for your company I've really really enjoyed it I'm sorry again about last week you know Lynn must have kicked the 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 the, uh, the camera out because it certainly couldn't have been me. And as I've got no drummer next or live. bass player, here she is. Sorry, what? next live date. What? Oh, oh, when's the next live date? The next live date is when is it? Saturday, fourth of May. The Saturday, the fourth of May. May the fourth be with you. Come on, that's how you're going to remember that. May the f okay. So I ripped it off Star Wars. It doesn't matter. You'll remember it. May the fourth with you so i'm doing a live stream on may the 4th but i'll be back with you with 
another tutorial on Saturday because although the master classes are finished which were for beginners predominantly then all, but all my other stuff all the other tutorials and stuff are going to happen on Saturday what am I going to play this Saturday I have absolutely no idea but I'm sure you will assist me in asking me to do my, let's say may I last song from your album for better sleep in um, listen to the album just go on it's on Rob Fenner go to robfenner.com Google my name, Rob Fenner. You'll have some fun. There's some funny stuff on there. You'll see me when I'm bloody 15 or 16 or something, jumping around with that Fender Telecaster. It looks like I've got ants down my trousers. It's hilarious. Uh, another, yeah, thank you very much, Steve. Steve Ward, my good mate, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Um, thank you all for the, yeah, well, you all seem to have enjoyed it. And um, thanks for sticking with us. Where's uh, Kev Marston? Thanks, Kev. Uh, <laughs> I was thanking Lynn for keeping me going, yeah. I can't wait for May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. Right, listen, I'm going to love you and leave you. You take care of yourselves, all right? Uh, and the more playing you do, the better. Remember, share everything you can. Now, how do I turn this thing off? Lynn! I'm going to ask the lovely Lynn. I'll play her a little tune while she's... Uh... Mm -hmm. I can't do it on that guitar. Lynn, where are you? She coming or what? I'll have to do another verse now. I'm singing a Good night, God bless everyone. I'll see you on Saturday. You want to say good night to the folks? Oh, sorry. Ooh, give them a wave, give them a wave. Sorry. Give them a wave. Nice, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> now, Lynn, please turn it off for me without oh. me breaking it. Okay. See you on Saturday, folks. Thank you for joining us. I think it's still going. <laughs> there we are.